am the swarm. Vengeance shall be mine. Gamers, welcome back to Oz Gamers. You are here with Stephen Farrelly. Uh, ringing in the new year, 2013, and um, let's start it out with a bang. We've got uh, Dustin Browder from Blizzard. Um, pretty sure most of you already know that he's been working on, you know, the StarCraft fan franchise. We've got uh, Heart of the Swarm on its way, um, and I, I wanted to start with that. Actually, uh, we have a bit of a saying in Australia, sort of uh, a long time between stumps. It's a cricket thing, mm -hmm. but um, you know, uh, Wings of Liberty was out quite a while ago. Almost two and a half years. Yeah, uh, is it is it sort of troublesome for you guys? I mean, I know it's the Blizzard when it's done, it's done type thing, but do you ever worry that maybe there's just too much time between you know that release and now this one? Yes. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we'd obviously love to do this stuff faster. You know, we know that our fans are passionate for these, you know, games. We know that they want to get them more quickly. We want to get them out more quickly. You know, we're not, you know, we're just a bunch of guys doing the best we can, you know, um, in, in making these products. The pressure to make them great is truly enormous. Um, and our desire to make them great is maybe too much. Like our perfections might be too high, but, um, yeah, we're always looking to sort of tune that time and do the best we can to reduce the amount of time between products. It's sort of, I guess it's a lucky thing that you guys almost exclusively work PC then because, I mean, two, out, two years between pro like projects would be a real real problem with uh, consoles. Yeah, I guess. Uh, you know, we are, um, you know, we can do some console stuff, you know, with Diablo in the future, so we'll see. We'll see how that goes for us. But yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a challenge for us, right? And the PC does afford us that opportunity to really um, do it however, however long it takes us. It's not the end of the world. We don't suddenly get to a point where we're crossing a console transition with something, you know, that was meant for last generation, so that we're going into next generation, anything like that. And so um, the PC has been very good to us in that way. Uh, I mean, two years again, we'll, we'll stay on this track. Uh, what's happened, what's changed for you guys technically? Because, I mean, technology-wise, I mean, uh, PCs are getting, you know, getting a bit more powerful these days. Obviously, you're working on um, an engine. Have you guys optimized that? Have you changed that much? Well, the engine's gone through a lot of different changes. You know, for us, we're exposing a lot more tools to our community uh, at this point to give them better access to do better games on arcade. We've done some optimizations as well to make the game, you know, run as fast as we possibly can at this point. We've added new physics uh, to the game and tuned it up quite a bit. So hopefully, we'll be able to use that physics a lot more often throughout the game. It wasn't something in our last iteration we could use very easily, and we weren't using it very often. Now we're trying to use it very strategically to really create. Um, a better sense of drama on the battlefield to make the battles look a little bit cooler without getting in the way of the you know the hardcore esports nature that this game sometimes has. Um, you know, you really have to ask some of the technologists to know exactly all the details. But I, I know they've made a bunch of changes to the engine and have been working for you know almost two years, um, upgrading, improving, polishing, tuning, providing both better tools, uh, better pipelines, both for us and for the fans, um, as well as you know hooking up more you know bling and flash to make the game experience a little bit shinier. Uh, now, just on that, on the physics, like I, I think it looks really cool. Uh, you mentioned in the um, presentation that you you're trying to find that red zone, that 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 place where it sits comfortably, where it doesn't sort of get in, get in the way. But did you guys toy with the idea of actually letting physics become uh, a combat element? Uh, no, we never did. Not seriously. It, it's so difficult top down to understand where something's going to go physically. It's a lot easier if I'm in front of you and I push you and you move back. I get it. But I'm looking at a whole army of people and I want to line up a shot just exactly right, but it's actually like 14 degrees off and it flies off and it misses. It's not really practical for us. Not 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 at the scale of StarCraft. If you imagine we had a smaller game with fewer units on the battlefield, it might be possible if you added a bunch of UI to set up stuff so that you players could you know cause things to happen. Like I'm going to you know shove this guy he's going to bounce off that tank or I'm going to shoot this shot and it's going to bounce off the wall and hit somebody else. You can imagine that working, but I think that would be a game. I think that the whole game would be focused on that and StarCraft has already got a lot of gameplay that's not focused in that direction. So it was never really a serious consideration for us except as you know, a way to sort of um, improve the look of the game. Now, for arcade games, I could see this being a very different story. I could imagine in arcade games that our fans might do some really crazy stuff and create some really cool physics-based mods. How important has that community um, arcade mod stuff been for you guys um, moving into this project? Well, it's very, very cool, the stuff that they're doing, and they're really providing a lot of content to a lot of our fans. We know that there's you know, almost as many games of arcade games played as regular core StarCraft games. So um, uh, people are spending at least you know, half their time, or some people are spending all of their time, right, just playing you know, arcade games. And so these guys are creating a lot of great value, and they're creating a great, fun sandbox full of lots of really cool games that a lot of people are having a lot of fun playing. 
you guys basically ship two games. I mean, you've got the single-player campaign and then you've got multiplayer. Uh, and it seems with each iteration that they actually sort of get a bit further apart because the esports stuff is obviously really important to those players and to the core guys that have been doing that for so long. But at the same time, you guys get to flex your muscles a little bit with the single player and come up with units that just wouldn't work in the multiplayer. Uh, is, it, is, that, is that difficult for you guys to have them separated so much or is it kind of, is it really a, a release to be able to play, with, play around in the single player that way? Creatively, it's absolutely a release to be able to separate the two and do what you want. They have such different needs. The single player experience uh, has a group of players who are looking for something that makes them feel powerful. They want powerful threats to fight against. We can tune those things against one another. And then in multiplayer, everything's going to be tuned against itself, right? Is, is the Zergling fair against other Zerglings? Or is the Zergling and Baneling relationship correct? Or the Rote Zergling relationship? You know, and, and let alone, you know, against other races, right? So I think it's absolutely liberating from a creative standpoint. Let, let's us make a better multiplayer game it lets us make a better campaign experience by far by being able to split those out and the challenge comes for players trying to transition between those two and so we had some challenge modes in wings of liberty some ways to learn some of the skills but they didn't really let you practice and bring everything together into one set there'd be a, a challenge mission for using hotkeys and a challenge mission for defending against fast rushes and those were all useful skills to have but you never got to bring all those skills together into a single map. And now in Heart of the Swarm, we've added three separate training maps that take you from the same game speed that you're getting in campaign all the way up to the game speed you're getting on ladder. And at the same time, provide you with more and more tips, tutorial, instruction on how to play, what you need to be doing um, that will take you naturally up into uh, a place where you might feel comfortable playing some versus AI with some people. Maybe you feel uncomfortable doing some unranked matches. Get you to a place where you've got some kind of chance to understand and engage with this really cool multiplayer experience. Is that a core focus for you guys to funnel players into the multiplayer? I mean, obviously you want everybody getting the most as, as much out of the game as possible. Yeah, but it, it's not really a goal. It's just we want to allow it if you want to do it, right? Like previously, if we had, and we, we've met with people all over the world now at different trade shows, at different events, you know, BlizzCon, and we've had a lot of people say, wow, you know, I love the campaign multiplayer now. No, thank you, right? I'm one of those guys. I don't know, right? Like, and so we feel like, well, I mean, there might be an interest, right? And they'll even sometimes say, oh, I would love to. I just, I can't, right? And so we figure for those people, if we can provide them with the tools, um, maybe they'll have the opportunity. Maybe they'll have more fun with the game. That's always the goal, yeah. how to get them to have more fun with the game. Was that was it an, an internal uh, incentive, or did you guys get a lot, of, a lot of feedback that sort of put you into that point of having the, the three training missions and or maps, I should say? I would say it's both. We had a lot of external feedback, which then promoted a lot of internal discussion. But I think the, the, the genesis of it was absolutely feedback right. um, from fans who were saying, I, I know, I don't understand. It's too hard. I don't know what to do. And that led to a lot of these modes. We're doing the training mode. We're doing the experience point system. So you get something for a game. Every time you win or lose, you get something back. And that was from our play experience as well. I'd have bad nights where I'd go home and lose five games in a row and go, oh, what a disaster, right? But at least now in Heart of the Swarm, even those games that I lost would be worth some experience points to get me some levels, get me some portraits, maybe some skins, that kind of stuff. And so a lot of it was based on external feedback at the end of the day. And then that you know, caused a lot of internal discussion about what the right moves would be. You know, should we be offering unranked play? Should we be offering you know, all of these things that would hopefully allow players to have a more, um, a less frightening experience you know, on, online? Now in the studio, which is where we're at right now, uh, do you guys have, is there a system in place where you can basically plug any of the single player units you've got into multiplayer to test them out. Like, how does that work? Yeah, no, we could test anything out with the, with the data system we have now. We can, um, our tools are great. We have some amazing tools engineers, and we have you know a company that very much is supportive of making and building great tools. And you see, we put those tools out as our editor that allows the fans to make these amazing mods. You know, we've all been playing. Um, and so we can very easily move things around, you know, from one version of the game to the other without any real difficulty. The reason I ask is because I want to know if there's a, a, a single player campaign unit that is just like ridiculous, ridiculously powerful that you guys just plug in every once in a while to um, to play with? Um, no, we don't usually do that. If we know it's going to be too much, we don't have the time, right, right to sort of mess around with that. I, um, we do have the ability in uh, in um, debug builds, which we play often enough, so if we find crashes, whatever, we can catch them, right? So we often play in debug builds. We do have the ability to summon units anytime you want into those debug builds. So when you're playing a multiplayer game, you just don't do that. Um, except, you know, if I'm losing a game, sometimes I'll summon 50 motherships, you know, just to just to finish the game. So sometimes we screw around a little bit, but for the most part, um, we, you know, we, we really focus on making the multiplayer as tight as we possibly can. What have you guys learned moving into this one from uh, Wings of Liberty in terms of uh, just telling story? So one of the things that, you know, in, in Wings for us is we're getting used to a lot of the tools, a lot of the storytelling techniques that we're using. A lot of the storytelling um, ideas have you know, sort of come from Brood War 
through Warcraft 3 to StarCraft as an evolution of our storytelling process. We had just a briefing screen in Brood War, really. And then in, in, War, in Warcraft 3, we've got you know, um, some characters talking in the environment. It got a little bit more elaborate, right? But still not that much bigger than the briefing screen, but a little bit more. It's not just talking heads. At least you can see characters moving around. When you get to StarCraft II, now we're building full sets. So we've got full sets of characters coming together. And so I think in many cases, we were learning to use a lot of those tools. And now I feel like we're still using a lot of the same tools, but we've really learned how to use them correctly and effectively. And we really have to focus a little bit less on how are we doing this and a little bit more on, okay, what are we doing in the scene? How is that motivated from the last scene? How does that move forward correctly into the next scene? And an example I can give you where I think, you know, um, Wings of Liberty had a few issues and Heart of the Storm I think has corrected a lot of this stuff would be in Wings of Liberty, you know, we had Zeratul show up on the ship. In many cases, and to give the prophecy to Raynor, in many cases this would be a mission just after you had a fight against the Protoss. Mm. So for a lot of players who didn't know who Zeratul was, they just fought the Protoss, they just spent 30 minutes killing Protoss, and here comes this cloaked Protoss onto their ship. Their first thought was, he's here to kill him. He's here to kill Rainer. And then Rainer goes, dude, what's going on? And like, oh, the prophecy. And you're like, what's happening? I just spent 30 minutes killing Protoss and this guy just shows up. This is weird, right? All those of us who know Zeratul were not shocked by this, right? But if you didn't, that was a very confusing moment. So I think we're, you know, we've gotten that kind of feedback from players and we're also a little bit less focused on how we're gonna get it done and able to get more on what we wanna get done. And I think it's produced a much tighter story experience. I will, will I mean, I, I think it's probably a no-brainer, but can we expect uh, missions similar to the Zeratul ones from Wings in Heart of the Swarm, like stuff where you're not actually playing as Kerrigan or Swarm? Um, there are some missions where we do some crazy stuff, but I'm not ready to talk about those yet. Um, all right, well, listen, we'll wrap it up with, uh, with one more, but um, I mean, it's a bit of a, I always kind of ask this question for, for games like this, but your favorite unit or your favorite character, like across the board? Oh, my favorite character across the board. Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm very partial, uh, I think at this point, to Abathur, and I think when you play through, you'll see why. Um, he, I like his new voice, by the oh, way. his new voice is so good. Uh, the actor did a great job, the writer did a great job writing him. Um, Abathur is this you know, monstrous uh, master of evolution that lives inside the Leviathan that spins the DNA and creates the creatures at Kerrigan's command, and he just, he just lives in his own little world. Abathur does not understand half of why Kerrigan does anything that she does. Um, he is absolutely an alien creature living in his own private, crazy little space that um, once you see it is kind of terrifying, sometimes tragic, and sometimes just hilarious, watching how confused he is by everything else that's going on around him. I think, I think he's my favorite character in Heart of the Swarm. Well, we'll, just, uh, we'll wrap it up there. Dustin, thanks so much for your time today. Um, and yeah, game's looking pretty awesome. Cool. Thank Cheers. You. Thank you.